everybody experiences it and nobody can escape it. It's like you, you all, everybody, if you try to escape it and you just lock everything down into what the mind can control and, you know, force its way through, it's like, yeah, you can do that. It's just very painful and it's diminishing returns, at least in my experience. Uh, so far better to have courage and faith and step out into the unknown and have exponential growth and abundance and blessings in your life just requires a bit more in the, in the immediate present and facing your fears and being honest with yourself. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of the Otto Gomes Show. My name is Otto Gomes, your host, uh, and very special, special, special <laughs> guest today, Graham Wardle, my brother from another mother. How are you today? It's been a minute. Yeah, buddy. Cheers, man. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Happy to be here chatting with you again. It's good to see you. I know it's been two years since we last connected, um, right in the middle of the, all the lockdowns and craziness that was happening in, in both Canada, US, I mean, so many countries around the world, it was a global thing, right? Yeah. And we were still, there's still kind of some stuff happening as we're oh, living yeah. in this reality, but let's use this time to catch up. Um, how has been your journeys in the last two years? Like, what, what have you been up to? Oh man. Uh, just focusing on the podcast and thanks again for having me on your show. I, I loved chatting with you last time. So I'm excited to dive into all things, uh, life and crypto and uh, what's going on in the world. Also with you too. Uh, the last two years for me has been, oh man, it's been an eye opener, I guess you could say, um, and grounding and just sort of like a recalibration. I think so much of what's gone on, on in the last few years has just kind of opened my eyes and kind of yeah. made me prioritize what's important in my life, what's not important, and revealed uh, like a mirror, you know, a lot of things in my life that I wanted to work on and improve and change and, uh, you know, self-sovereignty, personal responsibility, kind of the ethos, which I see is, you know, similar to Bitcoin, uh, is is kind of the, the principles and values that I'm sort of accepting and acknowledging to be much more a higher priority in my, my value chain. Um, so yeah, so you know, I've just been working on my podcast. I wrote another book of poetry. Uh, I was a finalist in the Canadian book club awards for my book of poetry. So that was great to receive that, uh, that honor. Um, and yeah, just kind of refining life and simplifying and enjoying myself more and doing a lot of inner work. I think that's been my main focus because I know that all the exterior stuff is a byproduct of where I'm at internally. So I'm, I'm, I'm very mm. focused on that. And I think that's very important. So, uh, and then just recently I'm getting back into acting. My agent called me and she said, Hey, you ready to get back out there? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Cause you know, during COVID there was, you know, mandates and masks. And if you didn't, if you weren't vaccinated, you have to get stand in this lunch line. And I was just like, I don't want to play games. I'm not going to participate in this stuff. I'm not going to do that. And so I just, she's, you know, she's like, all right, well, we'll put you on ice <laughs> until, until it's all over. So it's kind of, kind of easing up a bit, I guess for right now. So I'm like, all right, let's, let's start it up again. So I'm excited to be doing some more acting and telling stories in that capacity as well. So yeah, man, that's, that's me in the last couple of years. That's, that's what I've been up to. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, for you, I've noticed personally a change in you. You've changed quite a bit just in passing when I've seen your posts and stuff. And when we just got on the call now, I made that comment to you because uh, I can tell you've been through a lot as well. You've had a lot of changes as well. So update me. What's been the last few years like for you? I appreciate you asking. Um, thank you for sharing where, you, where you're at with everything. Um, yeah, man, I've been through, I feel like through the ringer a little bit when it comes to uh, my intimate relationship and truly just uh, like, like you, like really doing a lot of inner work this last year and restructuring priorities, um, in honesty, establishing true values, you know, mm -hmm. really, really establishing the values that I want to live with for the rest of my life. Um, I, I tried to create this pattern in my life in this last year of allowing my belief systems to kind of be challenged, uh, you know, trying to take in as many perspectives as possible without being biased and without, mm -hmm. and, and not, not taking everything, but taking the things that resonate from the experiences that I've been having. And that's been really helpful to reground. Um, this last year, 
I went through some struggles with the, my relationship, uh, seven years and in the decision to separate, we decided to separate in the beginning of the year. I went to Florida. Um, my dad had quadruple bypass surgery, uh, mm -hmm. about a year ago, year and a half ago now. And the beginning of this year, he, his, his he just started to decline again, or actually the end of last year, he started to decline. And so everything started happening at the same time. And I'm like, well, let me go home, spend some time with my, my dad and my family, my mom. And uh, I knew I would never regret that time. I thought I was going to be there for a month, four and a half, five months went by. Oh, wow. <laughs> and yeah, it was, it was a while. Um, and I even, I even stopped posting. I, I stopped posting on Instagram, stopped posting everywhere. Uh, I actually haven't talked to, to, to anyone about this like live like this, like mm. through, through something recorded. Um, but what I noticed when I left, so I left about a month ago, I am, I'm actually in Austin right now. Uh, you know, Alex Zek, Alex. Oh yeah. 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 So we've been working together on a lot of things. He's been building this path, uh, towards structuring the private sector. You know, I work with, with blockchain with crypto and we're trying to figure out the layers together to essentially create our own private sector bank and system uh, and, and facilitating that for others. And when I came here to Austin, I've been here for about three weeks now. I'm going to be here for another three weeks. Um, when I came to Austin, I started to realize the regression that I went through a little bit while spending time with my parents. Uh, you know, they say, this is what I've always heard. If you think you've met Buddha, if you think you're, you are Buddha and you're Zen, go spend a week with your family <laughs> and you'll, you'll, you'll know, you'll know at that point. And that's what I realized. Um, there was a little bit of a regression and made some decisions that kind of shook me up again. And so it's been a journey. It's been a journey of mm. just like, just finding the value system. It's, I think that's the most important thing. And, and I think that's like, says a lot about just reality and society. I think, I feel like most, you know, this might just be my perspective. But I feel like most have kind of lost sight of those values of mm -hmm. what is, of what is value? You know, what does it mean to stand on something you truly believe in? Um, but yeah, here we are. Right. Oh, I dude. mean, well, yeah, that's, thanks for sharing that with me. And that's, I could sense that I was like, man, Otto's like, He's been through some stuff. I didn't know if it was a breakup or if it was w what it was, but there was a, a rooting in your being that was like, um, I could just sense, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that's what you've experienced. Uh, you, there's your a deeper connection to yourself, but at least that's what's coming through to me. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I just spoke to someone about this a few days ago. I felt a little bit like I lost myself this last seven months. Um, I think it just had to do with a lack of proper prioritizing. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a vision for what I want to create for myself. Uh, I mean, I, since I was 12 years old, I've always wanted kids. I, literally since I was 12. I, I worked in the children's ministry growing up for like 10 years from 12 to 22, 23. And just being around kids all the time and doing like the illustrious sermons in church. Uh, I always just love that energy. And I, I try to keep hold of that growing up. Um, so I think that this last year just kind of shook me to reprioritize and go like, what do you want, man? Like, mm -hmm. what do you want with your life? Like, what is it that you're truly wanting to, to create? Yeah. And, and I needed to go through that. You know, it's like going through the, the, the pullback to have the realization, to have the awakening of it. So what, what came, I'm curious, what came up when you said, what do I really want? A family. I want, yeah. I want kids. I want a family. I want a place that I can, that I can feel grounded. Um, mm. you know, and I did the math in the last, it's going to be seven years now, maybe eight years. I've moved 12 times, <laughs> 12 wow. times, picked up my whole life, moved it to another location. And, and it's been, I almost kind of lost myself in the, uh, I became very airy, you know, yeah. not, not grounded. Yeah. And I felt like, I can just be blown in the wind and everything is okay. It's fine. Hmm. Uh, now I'm just feeling like I need to solidify myself somewhere, ground in. Hmm. Yeah. Well, hey, dude, that's uh, what that's what's coming up for me. I mean, that's what I'm. At least, if that's what you're focusing on, I feel like you're on the right path because I can feel that it's like you're you're rooting. It's like your his auto's roots are like stretching into the earth and gripping. Yeah. So that's fantastic, dude. Thanks for sharing that. 
I appreciate that. I mean, this kind of goes into a little bit of what I wanted to kind of talk about and ask you. Um, you know, I feel like there is this disconnect from, uh, I want to say, you know, godly energy or, or the, this, the, the nature, like what is truth, what mm. is in resonance. And most have been so distorted by media, by movies, by all these, all these, uh, tools that are being used to manipulate. Um, what would you say, and this might be like a really broad question and maybe you can layer it out, but what would you say is the point? What is the meaning of life? I know that's like, <laughs> tell me what is the meaning of life, my friend? <laughs> I love it. Um, Hey man, I, I hear you on that one. Uh, I, years ago, I remember hanging out with a friend on, on a f film set that I was on and they said that they said, what do you think the meaning of life is? You know? And, uh, I'm a big fan of Victor Frankl's work, you know, his, his book, man's search for meaning. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So that was something that kind of reading that book kind of updated my operating system to understand how we project meaning on everything. Right. So for me, mm -hmm. you know, what a, what a wonderful experience of life. And then we have this ability to create meaning and project meaning onto this conversation, onto our life in general, uh, as a whole, what do we want it to mean? We have the power to choose that. And that's kind of like it, at first it can kind of be like, well, what do you mean? I have the power to choose what things mean. Like, that's kind of crazy. Like, what if I choose the wrong meaning? Or what if I choose this meaning? Like, these are all the thoughts of the mind that kind of come into it. And then it's like, it's actually just fun. It's actually just play. Mm. It's actually just an experience and an evolution of a journey to be like, and yeah, that's a part of it. That's a part of, uh, discovering life and the experience of expanding of, of consciousness is like, we, we choose, we can choose to have the experience of not knowing the meaning of exploring the meaning of, of thinking it might be a wrong meaning. It's all a big cosmic play in, in my books. And to me, that brings me a sense of peace and a sense of wonder and sacredness for my life. I can't prove any of this, but I always go back to, if I can't prove it or disprove it, how does it impact my life? And so this mm. way of looking at the world frees me. It brings me peace. It brings me sacredness and appreciation for the experience of my life. If I can just look at it as I am playing and finding, projecting, creating meaning into this whole experience. So why not have a fun time and do something that's meaningful and, and resonates with me? So I think when it comes to the meaning of life for me personally, um, it's finding and celebrating sacredness and mm. in everything and in, in all around us. And that can be very hard sometimes when you're going through challenging times. It's not all just like, woo, woo everything's great, you know? Uh, yeah. when you're going through pain and suffering, uh, there is a silver lining, but it's really hard to see. And it's not like about ignoring the pain or trying to push it away and be like, I'm just trying to find the silver lining. It's about allowing yourself to go through what you're going through because that's sacred and that's difficult. Um, and that's growth and that's beautiful. And that's, you know, becoming more of all you can be. And so, um, it's, it's, a, it's been very painful for myself in my own journey of, of my own separation. I've been through something similar, Otto, and I remember that being excruciating and very, very challenging, but essential for the broadening of the spectrum of experience of my life and the sacredness and yeah. the beauty and the meaning. And uh, it was very, very painful, but I now can see it as many silver linings, many lessons, uh, many ability, uh, opportunities to celebrate the sacredness of life. And the choices and the decisions that I've made, I can see the impacts. I can see, oh, okay, I need to learn this now. Or, oh, okay, I've learned this. Look at, look at how much I've grown, Graham. Like, you know, take that in, accept that, acknowledge that. You know, this is someone, I've, I've become someone that I, I, you know, years ago I wouldn't have recognized because of the values that I hold and the, you know, integrity now that's very important to me that I didn't have before COVID. It was, it was important, but not as important. Um, going mm -hmm. through my divorce, and then going through COVID was like integrity, number one value. If I don't have integrity, nothing else matters in personally for my operating system. If I can be the most loving person, generous and caring, but if I don't have an integrity with myself, it's not sustainable. It's not going to last. Mm -hmm. It's not going to actually come from that rooted, authentic place. So to me, uh, that's the, the meaning that I like to create or, or, or um, project onto the world that would that gives me a sense of satisfaction. It gives me a sense of 
um, bliss and, and lights me up. And, and I'm sure that will continue to refine and evolve, but it's, it's something that works for me. So, but it's open-ended. So oh. the, the, the answer to your question is it's open-ended, man, but that's, that's what it is for me. <laughs> that, that's also true. I mean, you said everything beautiful, but uh, yeah, you're right. That, you know, things, things are, are evolving as we're, we're moving through this, these experiences. Um, but I love your answer. I love your answer. It is all about fun. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm a crypto guy. I talk about relationship to money. One of my taglines is always remember gamify your abundance. And when I say uh. gamify, it's like have the childlike relationship with experiences, with money, with the way you relate to it. And also let's be more creative, <laughs> you know, let's Amen. be more, more creative with how we transact and what, what we consider an exchange of energy. Um, you know, I was just talking about this, uh, a little bit about having fun with a friend of mine. He came to visit, he's helping me do a lot of rebranding and he and I both agree in, you know, just healing yourself and going through the, the physical, the emotional, the, the, the spiritual. And it was an interesting conversation. Cause he was like, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because there is this, uh, this normalized narrative around this practice where it's just like, no, no, just go into Zen. Like, oh, you're feeling, no, 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 just, just let it, just push it down. You're going to Zen. And it's like, no, no, you need to kind of work through that mm -hmm. because what we believe what was the problem is happening is that as you're healing, as you're healing and you're kind of detoxing, you're pushing out all this gunk that's built into trauma, the cells, they become more permeable. They, they become like more open to new things. And then you really have to be, become aware of what you're consuming. At that point, mm -hmm. right? As you heal, the, you start to become more open. And you have to become more aware of what you're you're consuming and how you're consuming it. Um, so if you're not letting, if you're not feeling that pullback, if you're not going through or allowing yourself to emote and to go through the release of those tensions, then you will just reabsorb it as mm -hmm. you're healing. Mm. And so it's like, you know, going through the process correctly, letting go, processing, and then going and approaching and, and relating to things in a more childlike filter in a more fun perspective, you know, in that embodied feeling of love, uh, that's where it's becomes more long-term, right. Mm -hmm. Where it becomes more of like perpetual. Um, if, yeah, dude, I, I totally agree with that. What I wanted to ask you about, uh, when you're working with people, uh, with money and, and gamifying their financial abundance, I think is how you put it. What, what, mm -hmm. what comes up that blocks people from that, that you've experienced in your working with the people that you do? 99% of the times is themselves, you know, just there's their own beliefs and their own normalized uh, perspective or normalized behavior with the relationship. Like mm -hmm. I often say, it's like, uh, you know, this is a simplified perspective, simplified explanation of my perspective a little bit, but God is in relationships. You know, to, if you're looking for peace and love and, and God, you have to look at how you're relating to the thing. Mm. It's not the, it's not the things that are happening to us that is causing our emotion. It's how we're relating to the thing that is happening to us or how we react to it or what we do with it. Um, so yeah, for most is, I, I always say is like, um, in the relationship with money, if you look at yourself as a hose. And, you know, a hose, when you turn it on, the water flows through it and just, just goes right out. Right. Most people are pinching their hose. They have the hose like pinched up and because why? Because of generational trauma, how they were taught to deal with money in school, whatever it is, they are pinching the hose. And what happens when you pinch a hose? It's like trickling out, right? A little bit of water on occasion comes out. And then every time it comes out, you're like, <laughs> and you need to like take it in and you hold on to it and you, and you're like, you try to protect it and you try to, you know, you become kind of selfish and, and push mm -hmm. it, push, push things away. And you really hold on to it for a rainy day. You know, there's all these little phrases that you can, uh, you know, come up with or yeah, uh, yeah. justify the action. So that relationship and this is my also belief about the law of attraction, how we attract things like is what we're, what we're putting out creates the magnetism polarity of the relationship, which then causes the reality. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I have it grounded in a lot of things, but uh, that's what I believe. And so if we are constantly relating with money as if it's something scarce and we need to save it, then that is what we are attracting. And you will always just be in that perpetual mode. 
So yeah, for most, it's just recreating that relationship, letting go of the negative polarity emotions so that you don't attract more of it. And the analogy of the hose is like unpinch, let go right. and flow the money into the things that are going to bring you more love, more excitement, more fun and all that. The, the pinching is obviously an unconscious uh, thing that people are doing. Otherwise they would yeah. just let it go. So the unconscious yes, pinching yeah. is coming from a false belief, a story, a fear. And, and is it by moving into that that and 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 I guess healing that or or, or uh, dismantling it that, uh, that the the grip is released? Or what's the process like? Yeah, I would I would say uh, you know Dr. Joe Dispenza. Oh yeah, Dr. Joe. Yeah, so he he wrote a a bunch of books. Uh, you are the placebo is a great one if you haven't read it. Um, oh, I forgot the other name now. The other one becoming supernatural. So he talks about yeah, yeah, that, that one. Uh, so he becomes, <laughs> he becomes the, or it, it talks about uh, neuroplasticity and the ability, the brain's ability, the body's ability to, to uh, create new grooves. You know, mm -hmm. recreate the 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 wiring in the brain so that for something that you want. You know, sort of like self hypnosis, uh, just by awareness. And so there is a process. There is a process. You're right. It is unconscious for most. They are pinching the hose and they're holding on to the tension because it feels normal. You know, it feels comfortable feeling, feeling uh, something that is healthy and something that is comfortable is like a fine line. Yeah. And the difference is awareness is just becoming mm -hmm. aware. And it, it depends on how someone can become aware. It can be somebody reflecting back. Like that's what my students, when they come in, I'm reflecting back to them. Um, a lot of the different layers of that. For others, it has to be something dramatic, you know, something big, a big event that happens, and then they become aware of it. Mm. Um, based on Dr. Joe Dispenza, it takes 40 days, 45 to 60 days of aware, aware be, um, conscious behavior, a conscious choice for them to become second nature, right? Mm. Actually, uh, this is really interesting. My acting coach in school, uh, two years of Meisner training in Santa Monica, he taught us one thing that like stuck with me forever. He said, there's four layers of awareness. There's unconscious incompetence. So unconscious incompetence, you're not conscious about the incompetence that you have the behavior. And then there's conscious competence where you become aware of the incompetence. Uh, most people are kind of right there. They're unconscious about their bad behavior or the things that is limiting them. And then there is conscious competence. So for those that truly become aware, whether from an event or from just the reflection of others, uh, that's the practice. So like the 45 to 60 days of practice and really mm. focusing on that behavior. Most people stay there, uh, unfortunately. You know, it's hard to become the master. To become the master is the 10,000 hours, right? You have to like really do the work, uh, which is the last layer. It's unconscious competence. Right, where it becomes second nature and, and the body just kind of reacts and, and, and uh, uh, the gut emotions, the gut instinct kicks in. So that's what I would say. That it's definitely a, a self-limitation that happens. Mm -hmm. Interesting, dude. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I've, I've often been examining my own life in that sense of like relationship. It's about your relationship to everything, your relationship to money, mm -hmm. to women, to, to work, to family, to friends. And in that relationship, so much is revealed and so much can be opened up to expand, to heal, to celebrate, but it's all there. It's all there underneath yeah. the surface if you have the courage to look. And I'm so glad we're talking about this because, you know, what I've come to understand about this reality now and really like comprehend and look at the layers that I've looked at, it's this lack of relationship with self mostly. Like mm. I feel like the majority, and this is global, um, you know, I'm the money guy. I talk about the monetary systems. Uh, there's 194 countries in the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. And that is all that whole system are, is using the British crown uh, bond papers, which essentially is what kind of is flowing the, the worth or the value to the few. And so we've all have been indoctrinated, uh, I would say, through school, through media, through movies to believe that we are in debt to those systems. Mm. And man, the amount of research I've done to see, to, to be able to see this is, 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 has been a lot this last four years, but I've noticed that the biggest issue is a, is a lack of relationship to their identity where most are 
because of the structure, they're identifying with their name, which through this structure, the name is actually what these systems are focusing their power on and their pressures on. And so if you're identifying with your name, then you're going to always feel that pressure. When in reality, we are not our name, truly, mm-hmm. especially in the way that they write it. We are not our name. What are we? We are, you can say your body, but even more, you're not even your body. You are, this is the vehicle. You are the soul. You're the essence that is driving this body. And so uh, try to take a moment, like think about what I just said for 30 seconds, you know, to identify with this. When you start to identify with this physical thing that you are, this uh, soul, this essence that is inside this body, it should, you know, the more you practice that, it should start to shift in how we relate to these systems. And so that's, that's been my, my journey now is just to kind of bring clarity to that and, and create, you know, analogies and guidance uh, for them to be able to shift that. That's dope, man. Okay. So there's so many things I want to ask you about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the first one is when you're talking about the legal stuff, are you talking about like, or the, the name, identifying the name, are you talking about like the legal, lawful, like all capitals name, the, the straw, mm-hmm. like the, yeah, the living, the living man versus the, the corporation, that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I went deep into that in the last three, four years. Uh, You know, I've been in crypto for since 2012. And then that to me was like a big wake up moment when I saw blockchain, because I'm like, Oh, this tool, this is what we needed. We needed our own operating system, our, our own storage of value that we've never had, like the people's reserve. And then I, uh, I, I, but there were still layers that I was still not aware of that I, as I learned them, uh, these last four years, I started to notice this, like, oh, there's this whole other layer yeah. here of the this, you know, quote unquote matrix that is creating that control. You know, whether we store our stuff properly or not, if we're not relating to the system properly, we're always going to be sucked back in to the uh, traps and the yes. contracts. Uh, but yes, yes, it's the difference between public sector and private sector. Right. Uh, public sector is for dead registered entities. Private sector is for living, breathing men and women. And one can't do the business with the other unless they go through contract and it's all underneath trust law. So that's like, that's global. That's 194 Whoa. countries out of 197. They all structure that way for, for that exact reason. Okay. 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 Forgive me. <laughs> I have one more question. <laughs> I love no, we can talk about it. I, I'm, I'm actually loving this because you are, um, you're just generating my, the answer. You're like my, I'm, I'm getting uh, activated. So please. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I've heard a lot about this and just, just kind of like on the surface, kind of looked at it be like, this is interesting. Uh, who's done this successfully? Cause I've heard a lot of stories uh, about people like, yeah, yeah. All you got to do is this and you never have to pay taxes again. Or all you got to do is this and you can do, you know, any bill or any, um, what does it call a ticket that you get from a cop? You can just write on it this, yeah. this thing and then you can give it back and then you're it's paid through your birth certificate because they took out this money on your name. And what I'm like, has anybody actually done this and does it work? Because there was a guy I I heard uh, a couple years ago when COVID first started, he was talking about this and then he mysteriously Mm -hmm. died in his apartment by himself. And you're like, Oh man, like what happened to that guy? Like what happened? Like maybe (laughs) it was nothing, you know, maybe it was, it was a natural causes, but uh, anyways, um, I'm curious as to how far you've taken this. If you, if you want to talk about it publicly and successes, failures, or or, or I should say hiccups that you've uh, encountered along the way. Yeah. Um, so I've done a lot of the research work. So I know I, I definitely have embodied the layers. Uh, I've met people that have done the process. <clears throat> I'll say this. I've taken, I'd say four or five courses in the last four years, at different layers. Uh, each course was like sh- get showcasing me a different layer of the restructuring of that relationship and becoming aware of it. Uh, one of the courses was more on the paperwork. One was on more on the embodiment, like being able to shift the identity. Uh, the other one was more on how to do the actual, you know, back and forth documentation with the systems. What I've come to learn is that most have been approaching it straight from common law. So this is how yeah. it all layers. Every system in the world, 194 countries, they layer this way. You have the theoretical, so etherical all on top. What is that? concepts, that's belief systems, that's spiritual. You know, it's like looking at all the things that you can't touch, see, smell. It's all above, all up there. Then you have below that trust law. Okay. What what does that mean? Trust law. Well, imagine you walk up to someone you've never met. Uh, Are you immediately going to sign a contract with them? 
if they hand you a, a contract? Probably not, right? You're probably going to be like, I don't know you. Like, like, who are you? Like, let, let's talk about life. Let's see, you know, let's see if we, if I can trust you. So boom, right there in this reality, the first layer is trust. We need to be able to trust each other. Then below that, you have physical men and women. Where we stand in reality is where? On the land. And so there is law on land, right? Land, air, water, that's law. Uh, and that's how it's all based on ecclesiastical law, which is underneath trust law. And that is a system, uh, it's a very simple system. Uh, the common law of the land is a very simple system. There's only a few things you have to follow. Don't murder, don't hurt, don't steal, don't destroy other people's property and honor your agreements. And then below that is commerce where we get trade law or, or, or uh, you know, uh, commerce law, maritime law, they call it the law of the ocean. And so that is for to do business with or to do business as Okay, so that's the layer that a lot of people are getting confused in their identity and and identifying with their legal digital dead registered entity version of themselves and not the not the actual body. So what's been happening is oh, and all of this is uh, all of this is facilitated with contract law. So in this reality, we have the free will to sign any contract. That's the truth. Hmm. Contracts cannot be pierced by registered entities, you know, unless there is an agreement between both parties and there's con conditional acceptance between both parties. But government can't go and, and pierce through the veil of a contract. And in the contract, if you sign it, that's what it is. That's why, um, you know, BDSM, right? Bondage, that kind of stuff. That's why you can sign a contract with someone and get smacked around and then you can't turn around and claim assault because you had Signed the contract. You signed it, right. So this is how this reality works. And it all started when we were born with our parents as the grantor of you as the baby signing the birth certificate, which is a bond certificate, giving the state authority to generate or create a corporation, uh, a trust, uh, called a legacy trust or a legacy account in your name. And so what I, like I said, what I've noticed that most have been doing in this path is they try to go directly from common law into maritime law. And you can't do that because mm -hmm. you've signed agreements. You've actually gone through, you, you've agreed for this to happen. And so I found uh, Alex Zach. So Alex Zach, he's working with a non-bar attorney. It's a, it's a, essentially an attorney that has gone through all the schooling, has done all the work. And then when he got to the license, he's like, I'm good because the, the bar, the, that organization, it's a private organization that creates a lot of requirements and limitations to what you can actually do. Essentially, if you're uh, representing someone as a bar attorney, you are the representative of that minor. So everybody that doesn't take a hold of their estate, they're considered a minor in the system. So they will always side with the law if there is a conflict. So if there is like a, a conflict between what the law says or what the individual's you know, um, uh, mitigating circumstances were for the thing. Sorry, we're not, I'm not here to protect you. I'm here to protect the law. Mm. And so, uh, no bar. Yeah. You don't want to be a, you don't want to get yourself a bar attorney. It, it, there's a whole rabbit hole in there and we'll, how that layers. But what I've learned with, with Alex X process is that it's about taking back control of your estate of your ship and not having to have representation or somebody that is owner or like in this situation, most people in the world, their trustee of that corporation is the reserve uh, bank, the reserve bank that is a part of that country. So you're not the trustee, you're the grantor, and you're supposed to be the beneficiary. Because the system has been flipped in that structure, they have, have essentially broken trust law. And so you can, you can request as the grantor, you can say, hey, trustee, you didn't do your job, so I'm going to evoke I'm going to dismantle your authority as a trustee and I'm going to transfer that to another trust. And then that's the process that Alec is helping people with is creating, it's called an SPC HDC. It's a secured party creditor trust holder in due course. And essentially that uh, creates not only the uh, correction of status, so it gives you back control of your estate with the system, but it also creates a protection against the British 
crown or the British paper uh, structure. So essentially, they they don't have jurisdiction anymore over your legacy account. And then there, and then yeah. that's where you through that structure you can do what's called discharging, is what you're describing. Where any interaction with the system, you can uh, think of it like a like a balance sheet. It's all it's all balancing. They're all just, they're just moving money around in a balance sheet. So in the legacy side of things, that is the asset side. That's their that's where the value is. Where by the way. Where does the value, like what is the deposit that they're using into that account? It's our signatures. So every time we sign documents, that turns into a security that they take and then they deposit through the, their treasury direct bank account. And then it creates asset. And then what's on the other side? Liabilities. Well, the liability is you identifying with your legal digital version of yourself and interacting with the systems. So asking for a credit card, um, you know, when you get a ticket, when you get your driver's license, passport, all that stuff, they get something called a QCIP number and they use that to deposit into your legacy account, which then adds up in value over time. I know that was very complicated, but Dude, that's is, no, essentially I, I what it is. I understood most of that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, okay. So if, if you step outside of the system though, can you still get a credit card? Can you still get a car loan? Yeah. So think of it like this. The analogy that I usually give is the matrix. Uh, everyone listening, if you haven't watched the matrix, everything I just described, rewatch that movie with this in mind of how, in, uh, how you relate. It's all about the relationship. Plugging in, plugging out is how we are relating with the system at any given time. So think of Neo. Neo, he woke up, right? He unplugged. He's like, I'm a man. I'm physical. Here's my real body. And then he's like, processing, right? Letting time pass a little bit. And then he's like, I got to go back in. I got to go back into the matrix and do this and, and like change things or be, be the, 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 the light, right? Be me, be a Neo in the matrix because in the matrix, he was Mr. Anderson. Well, when he plugs back in, does he forget that he's Neo? No, he, he, now he, he knows he's who he is now, but he's now interacting with the system in an intelligent way with, so that he doesn't attract agent Smith. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the people that you describe that's doing the things that they're doing, it sounds like they're just approaching it from common law. That's like Neo plugging back in and going, but I'm Neo, I'm, I'm real. I'm not, I'm not fake. I'm real. And like trying to convince people that way. And it's like, ah, you're never going to convince anybody. They are, they are plugged in. They are in the system. So the path, this path that I've found with Alec and the, that we're building together it it changes you from being the um, being inside a, a maritime law into admiralty law. So that's that's what's above um, all these leaders, these uh, people in power. They're not they're not functioning or they are not relating to the system as a miner in maritime law. They're relating to it as the captain of their ship, and so they are an admiralty level inside commerce. So that's commerce area in, in law of the ocean. You have the people, you know, in the hierarchy in a ship, you have all the people below the officers, they're in maritime, which is the law of who? The captain. Captain is an admiralty law. He can make the law in that ship. So then like, imagine you've been a skipper in the ship that is the United States or, the, or Canada for your whole life. And now you're like, I'm done. I'm going to be the captain of my own ship. And then what happens in the ocean when there's two boats and they're, they're looking at each other like, ah, don't touch me. I won't touch you or else it's war. <laughs> you know, there's a, a non-written agreement there that like, you know, we are our own nations here. That's what we're doing is taking back control of your ship. Uh, you know, that movie Wally, -E, that, that oh, yeah. Disney, yeah, yeah. That Pixar movie. Yep. That's a, that's another little mini documentary on taking back control. Like we've all been asleep on the ship that's just been traveling the stars and, and nobody, you know, nobody's driving the ship. It's a system. And then you wait, they woke up and they're like, we got to take back control of the ship. That's what we need to do, you mm -hmm. know, in this reality and, and, and recreate that relationship with ourselves, with how we're viewing the systems. Again, this is why I love blockchain because it's allowing us to create a brand new relationship now uh, to utilize, to use as our operating system outside of these third parties. So, Dude, that's fantastic, man. Um one of the things that I've, I've said before uh, when I'm talking about crypto or Bitcoin is, and I've said this to, to some of the people um, 
that follow my my work and I said I said you know I love Bitcoin I think it's great I think the principles of it are great but I said ultimately it's your relationship to a higher power to yourself um, and that ability to to have that discernment and and honesty with yourself because we are building from that and if we build all these new systems on blockchain but we haven't done the inner work we're going to recreate the unconsciousness on the blockchain. <laughs> You know what Dude, I'm saying? You just, I loved that you just said that, you know, because I've been saying this for, I feel like years now I say, look, uh, blockchain, this tool is amazing. It's amazing, amazing, amazing. It's this new thing that we can all create with. Uh, but like every other tool in this reality, everything has a multifaceted use, right? Yeah. Everyone can come in and be creative with that new tool. And I, I believe what's been happening with blockchain is that with uh, so i would say i would say there's maybe 5 to 10 chains that are truly decentralized that are like they kind of got came out of grassroots like nobody's the founder or owner of it it's just circulating it's like an organism now living organism that's kind of being pushed around and 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 and, and be, staying alive based on interactions with and the people that believe in it um but i would say 99.9% of the projects that exist are either outright scams, which those are fairly easy to pick on and then kind of see and, and go through the layers and go like, ah, this doesn't feel good. But the but the vast majority is unconscious scams or indoctrination scams, meaning they were developed by coders that didn't work on their relationship with the money. They didn't try to become aware of the current, you know, traditional banking concepts from the monetary system. And they're taking the same old flow of energy and coding it on the new tool and calling it new. It's yeah. like well, we're slapping, you know, putting putting <laughs> lipstick on a pig, yeah. and saying and saying it's uh, <laughs> it's you know Disney or something. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me that that's happening, yeah. and that's why I teach what I, the way I teach to become aware of that. Yeah, man, and then that's the only way that you actually can create new, new sustainable changes from that inner place. And all these technologies are great. I'm a big fan of technology. I love you know virtual reality. Oh yeah, it was one of the things I wanted to to share with you. Um, about virtual reality and the identification with self mm. after I uh, tried my first VR experience. But uh, yeah, all these technologies are fantastic. But yet if their inner work isn't done, we just end up recreating all the same problems in a new way. And it's kind of like, okay, great. Now we're back to square one. And then people get apathetic and they're like, nothing's going to change. Everything's screwed. It's like, no, <laughs> it's actually because we haven't got to the root. And once you get to the root, mm. that's where transformation occurs. That's where it happens. That's where a new life is born. And and then new things, we see life in a new way and new opportunities were always right there, but we couldn't see them because of the level of consciousness that we were at. And then it's like, oh, now I could, it was right here the whole time. It was here. All I needed to do right. was move through this pain. Because that, that's the thing. It's, it doesn't matter. Oh, you know, it's like everything is going to happen around yeah. you. The things are going to happen. They're changing. They're, they're trying, you know, they're doing their best to pull individuals into the certain layer that they want. Yeah, that's great. You know, that's happening. But like, how do you relate to it? Like, are you allowing that to affect you and how you relate to it? Yeah. And that's where the key is. Like you're saying, it's like working on that relationship to self is so fundamental. It's so important because that is what's causing the pressures. That's what's causing yeah. the change in action or the, or the effects on your actions or proactiveness to things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you ever tried VR before? You ever tried those VR headsets? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what kind did you try? I mean, there's a, so many different types out there now. Um, I actually have a camera that has uh, tw uh, 16 4K lenses. What? That's well, like one of a kind. Yeah. It's really cool. I so jealous. this company, <laughs> I know it's, this company took a like heat sink from a computer yeah. essentially. And then, and then around it put 16 lenses and turned it vertically. So imagine like the, the wide, the wider brim is like up and down and then in post or like as it's and it's a it's a live camera too so like in real time it's stitching all of it together wow and so when you actually watch it through the vr it's as it like it feels like you're in the room you is know it, like you're actually there in the room and 3d or is it just spherical uh so it's it's a cylinder shape camera yeah but when you look when you because of the way that they built it having 16 lenses and like the stitching yeah you know when you you know when you do these um 
a lot of these newer cameras, they're just like one or two lenses and they're like a bubble lens. Yeah. And so when you do the VR on it, you, you feel like you're in a bubble. Like you feel like, yes. oh, I'm in a bubble in the space. I can see everything, but I, I'm not really there. That, this one doesn't do that. You're mm -hmm. actually, you, it's like you step into the space and you can see the depth like in the corners, you know, and you're like, whoa, it's, it's even kind of off putting a little okay, bit. Okay, cool, cool. Um, That's awesome, dude. Okay, cool. What's the camera called? Uh, so the company's called Live Planet. Oh, I've never L I V E. It. Yeah, it's uh, this came out maybe three, four years ago. Okay. Um, they also have a company, or they also had they created a blockchain solution. They did uh, block uh, blockchain transcoding, so they can they can um, they can stream this live camera. That's actually the reason why they built the blockchain because it was such a heavy stream. It's a um, uh, uh, you know all four K. A uh, lot of heavy data that's trying to stream. Uh, they wanted to be able to stream 4K to people's phones, and so they were able to kind of solve that solution using the blockchain. And you need something; you don't need much. You need like six to eight megabytes of download speed per second wow. to be able to stream 4K through this blockchain system. Wow, dude! Uh, yeah, it's actually pretty epic. That's epic. Uh, it's called Video Video Coin. Or okay. Vivid Labs is the is the company name. I'm gonna have to check that out. I I I brought it up yeah. because you were talking about identity and identifying in, in incorrectly or or misaligned, and this is the whole sort of root of the confusion. Mm. Uh, and then you know within the system, and then you had to wake up and understand these principles. The first time I tried VR was one of those Google cardboards where you put the phone in the front, and you mm. it was like a helicopter scene or something. And uh, I was on a film set at the time and the camera operator came over and he said, Hey Graham, I know you like tech, tech stuff. He says, check this out. And he, and he gives me the cardboard and I put it up to my face and I'm on this helicopter and I'm looking around and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is crazy. He's like, I know. Right. And then I was like, man. And so like that day or the next day I went and got a, a, a cheap VR headset. I can't remember which one it was. Um, and I spent like two hours just watching films. Um, I think it's, is it Chris Milk who does the music videos? I don't know if you know him. Um, I think it's him. He has a, He had an app that was like a big VR app back in the day. I'm, sh I'm sure it's still big. But um, anyways, <clears throat> I watched all of his films. And, and, and I remember taking the headset off and being like, oh my God, like this body is just a really advanced headset. I just don't know how to take it <laughs> off the same way that I can take off this head, this, this VR headset. Cause it was like such a distinct feeling of being in this world. And then I like back in this world, I'm like, what if this body and this brain and these eyes and everything, this is just a really advanced VR headset that my consciousness, my essence has come into. And I have forgotten, I have identified with the name Graham, the body, you know, it's same, similar to the legal, the, the, the legal fiction, I think they call it with uh, your name mm -hmm. in all capitals and whatnot. We've identified with these things, not knowing it. And we have forgotten mm -hmm. how to take that step back and take the headset off and be like, this is not who I am. My essence is so much bigger than this, this body, this name. Anyways, it was a, a fascinating experience. And I was just like, man, I, I love the ability of virtual reality to, it's dangerous, obviously, because I, I, can, I can see people getting completely lost in this. Uh, this technology as it's refined and, and becomes more and more prevalent. But the, the capacity also for storytelling me, I'm a storyteller. So I'm always thinking about how do you tell mm -hmm. stories to bring people back to the wonder and awe inside themselves and, and wake them up to this wonderful, beautiful, sacred life that we all have it, through a story. And I think, man, VR would be a fantastic medium to tell this type mm -hmm. of story of literally waking up. Um, anyways, that's my little that's, rant about I that. I love that. No, <laughs> I, I absolutely love that. And <clears throat> I mean, you, you've heard of the uh, double slit experiment. Yeah. The observer effect. Yep. I mean, they just proved that, you know, there was, they came out, uh, science papers that uh, essentially that's what's happening. The observer effect is real that it, you know, um, the consciousness uh, has an effect on the thing that you're experiencing. You know, there's that saying, like if you're in the woods and a tree falls and nobody's around to, or if, if, uh, if a tree in the, <laughs> I said that completely wrong, <laughs> if a tree in the woods <laughs> fall and nobody's there to hear it, does it make it's a sound? sound? Yeah. Um, but maybe not <laughs> because there's we'll no observer. <laughs> uh, we'll never know because I'm never, <laughs> nobody can be there. But I mean, I think, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like it, it's like, we've all normalized certain filters because maybe we feel comfortable in them. Maybe because we're trying to avoid shame from family, friends, whatever. 
there uh, for sure, no matter, re- I, I really believe no matter where you're at in this journey, there is something or there's, there's layers that's creating a filter, mm-hmm. you know, not negative or positive, just a filter. It's like something that is uh, uh, giving a, you know, essentially creating a bias of that experience. So that's why I've been practicing, you know, what I said earlier so much and just taking in as many perspectives as possible, being curious, asking questions, um, uh, you know, uh, realizing that there are not only two ways, but many ways to look at any given situation. And it's how I choose to relate to it, which will make my experience. Uh, Joe Dispenza says, your personal, your partner, you know, maybe this was uh, Jordan Peterson, actually. Um, uh, your personality creates your personal reality. Well, that's Dr. You Joe. Know, that's what, for sure, Dr. Joe. Okay, that is Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like how you relate. That's part of your personality. How you react to things. That's part of your personality. Yeah. So we can we can create our own. And we can be, uh, you know, in control of that reality. I yeah, my opinion. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, man, I love this conversation. Uh, you know, I, I I wanted to ask. I saw a lot of posts that you made recently. Well, not recently, maybe in the last year, about scammers, scammers using your face. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I don't know how your experience has been. I've had friends get scammed by 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 somebody using my face. Uh, actually, a really close friend that had my phone number lose ten grand for it to a scam. So, and I was, and I remember sending him a message like, you had my number, you could have texted <laughs> me and asked me if that was me, but what, what, has it gotten worse for you? Like even with a, you know, especially with AI and deep fakes and like yeah. they're, they're taking our, the voice and using the voice. Um, have you had uh, any, any experiences with that? So recently? yeah. So unfortunately, um, I mean, I don't have an estimate. I mean, I don't have an exact number, I should say, but I can estimate probably around a quarter million dollars from the people that have the messages that I have personally seen of people that have said, Oh, my grandma got scammed for this much money or so-and-so I, you know, whatever I said, I was sending you money for whatever. So yeah, it's gotten really bad. Um, I think because of my previous work on a, a family television show, um, uh, that's popular, you know, it's, a, you know, over a hundred countries around the world. It was like top five on Netflix during COVID. And so it, it really got around. And I think, um, a lot of people were lonely. And so the scammers, they got yeah. wind of, that they could scam a lot of um, lonely people specifically around this television show that I was on, I guess. Uh, I know it's happening to others as well, but um, I, it just feels like a lot uh, that I'm you know, experiencing and, and other cast members of the show are experiencing as well. So yeah, I, no AI, no deep fakes yet. I'm sure they're coming. Uh, it's mostly just yeah. people generating fake Facebook accounts, using my photos and stuff, and then just commenting under posts and being like, I love you. And they always use kind of poor English. <laughs> And like, yeah, you're my yeah, number hello, one dear. fan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then like, hey, like I'm, I need some money. I'm in the hospital. I broke my leg. And then, you know, this uh, kind old lady uh, sitting at home is like, yeah, sure. I can help you out. Of course. Um, and then they just rope them in and keep them going. And then some of them believe, I guess some of the scammers have started relationships with people and, and, and effectively have uh, scammed them into thinking that they're relationships. So anyways, all that to be said, it's gotten really bad. I agree. And I, I personally have my own conspiracy theory about this. I think it's not a, I think it's like there's an element of we're not going to stop this. It would be to me personally with my limited knowledge of, of coding how easy would it be on a Facebook page? Like I have a Facebook page. Anyone who joins my Facebook page with the name Graham Wardle and has my photo as their profile photo, you block them. How that is so easy and simple to do, but they don't give you the option to do that. You have to go through and individually, you know, block and report and delete comments. And you can, I know where you're going with this. I agree with you hundred percent. Okay. But please. This is my theory <laughs> is that they're doing this on purpose so that they can roll in the digital ID you know, oh, we're going to save you from all these scammers. So now just sign up for the digital ID and it'll protect you from all these scammers. So right now the scammers are running free and there's a great movie called The Beekeeper with Jason Statham. And mm-hmm. I, I, have you seen that movie? Yeah, because yeah. I, I, I like, I like, uh, I can't help but like action movies. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's a great film. And he goes and he goes and he <laughs> finds all these scammers and he, and he beats them up and kills them and stuff. It's an action movie. Anyways, but what I thought was interesting in the plot line of that film is that these money was being funneled into political donations and, and sort of politics. I was like, of course it, of course that, you know, I would not be surprised at all. I put money on a roulette table of betting on life on that's exactly what's going on. Is there some sort of backdoor deals 
that these scammers are being allowed to kind of get away with things or run these scam farms. And then they funnel the money into political donations or nefarious activities. Uh, it's not just, you know, some guy that's really poor that's like, oh man, I'm trying to make it in this foreign country that I have no money. Uh, I'm sure there are some of those people, but I, I think that there is a bigger scheme at play because they're so organized and they just keep coming. Like they're just relentless. So that's my theory is that it, this is a conditioning for the problem reaction solution type uh, agenda of like, we got to get a digital ID. People aren't going to want to uh, accept it. So we got to make it painful and then say, here's the solution. And then all your pain will go away. Just sign away your, <laughs> your rights I, and who you are. I agree wholeheartedly. I really believe that. Um, that's happened in crypto a lot too. Uh, you know about the FTX scam yeah, yeah. or debacle that happened? It was like a year oh, and a half ago now. About it, yeah. uh, so I did the research on that when it was, when it was happening and I found that the, there was direct ties to the DNC, to the Democratic Party here in the US. And their money was flowing from the, the user's deposits. So it wasn't even like profits that the FTX was making. The, they were just uh, stealing Sam money? Bank, pretty much. Sam Bankman <laughs> fried was basically just using money for like personal stuff. And one of the things he did was, which I, you know, uh, he flowed the money into the DNC, did a lot of, uh, um, what do you call that? Gifting or um, I forgot the, what the word is, but, but giving the money to the politicians and and then getting the politicians to come in and like rep, like talk about FTX or uh, celebrities to talk about FTX uh. and do commercials. So there was definitely a push um, in this last year and a half of like m this type of scam where they're just rerouting the value and the money to you know these organizations that are supporting. Uh, and it's not, and it's not just one side, by the way. I know I thought, I know I said DNC, it's both sides. Both mm -hmm. sides are doing it in their own way. Yeah. You know, they're, they're creating the, this flow of value into these systems to keep you focused on it and the divisiveness. Yeah, um, man. but, but yeah, it's been, uh, it's been interesting to watch just you like know, this. You know of any, um, like decentralized identification, like a counter to, to digital IDs that are decentralized that you own your own data projects that are, are, are emerging or you're aware of? Yeah, actually. So I just, I've been working on a crypto project for the last year and a half. Um, we just launched it this past week, actually. It's called gems and it's a, uh, um, it's uh, real world asset tokenization. So we took two big lots of emeralds. I'm working with this mine company and we took two big lots of emeralds worth like we just did the revaluation a, a month ago or so, and it, it's valued at $640 million today. So we took that, we put it into a vault, and then we tokenized the shares or the ownership of the vault. And then we're selling those tokens. It's actually live right now. It's at a dollar a token. Uh, we're selling 20 million of them. But we used a company called Everest, and Everest, they were able to create, they're a, a RWA system. They were able to create a blockchain-based it's the only thing though, it's a biometric system, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't require uh, actually putting in any data. It's just a scan of your face. I know a lot of people are like really opposed to that and giving that information out to central systems. But um, if you guys watch my interview, I actually just did an interview with him this past week. I went into the, I went into details on how their biometric system is layered and how it works. Um, it uses a multi-signature lock wallet for the data where you own the one of the private keys that accesses that data. And then uh, a nonprofit organization has the other data and which is uh, based out of Malta. It's the foundation. That's where they do the custody of the, the uh, you know, whatever asset it is. And then the other one is uh, another organization that is out of uh, Malta EU. Like uh, it's underneath the, um, um, they're actually right out. They're outside of the jurisdiction of the European data protection unit. I forgot the name of the, the organization, but essentially you have to have all three keys to come together to get, to take the data out of the blockchain and you have to be the one to help authorize it. So unless you are giving your face and the pin code, which is two layers of protection, it, you can't access that information. So there, the reason he did that is because he wanted to work in the public sector and work with big banks. And he was mentioning in the interview, he's like, well, these banks, uh, when we were in discussion to create this, they were like, no, no, we need to have control of the data. We need to have access to the data. And he was, he, he was, he stood strong and said, no, 
that's not the that's not how this works. Blockchain is supposed to give us back control of our data, of our wealth, of our credit. And so it can't be that way. And so he made sure to create that split so that it's always on the blockchain. It's on the, always on the protocol. Um, so there are there are versions out there being created for sure. Um, doesn't mean they all are. Doesn't mean they're yeah. all the good ones, you know. So, so GEMS has the capacity for a decentralized identification system? Yeah, so it's two layers. No, Everest is the the layer that has the um, biometrics data, the identification and biometrics. And that's so that you can start to store all your information into the wallet, into the blockchain. And then you can use that to go to different platforms and interact with the platforms. And if they ask for KYC, uh, that's know your client. A lot of the central systems are requiring that now. Um, but if they have a connection to Everest, you can just approve it. And all it does is it sends um, it, the system on their side, checks the information or the code, and then it just sends to that central server, whatever it is that you're interacting with, it just sends like a, a, hash, a hash code that confirms that it's valid. That means like, oh, this is the person that is connecting to the, 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 the smart chain. And so that's Everest. Everest does that. It facilitates that. Uh, Gems is layered on top of that. So we have, that's the interaction that I just described. Uh, Everest uses their ID process to authorize Gems to release the tokens when you buy them, when you purchase them. Um, but yeah, no, Gems is all about um, storing true value on an asset back token, like a over collateralized token on the blockchain. And mm. so, you know, there's no central party that is holding the ownership. Uh, you are by holding the token in your own server, in your, in your wallet. But the, the, the gems are centralized in a vault somewhere. Yeah. So the, the gems are in a vault in South America. Um, we own the space of the vault of where the, gem, the gems are at. And so we created a trust around that. So, uh, irrevocable foreign trust. So those, uh, remember the layering I, I told you about. So trust law, that's the highest, essentially the highest law of the land above yeah. maritime law, above common law. Uh, once a trust gets created, it cannot be destroyed. It is living forever. And so the trust owns the, the vault, which is the shares of that is owned by the foundation as the management company. So like the company, the nonprofit that is uh, just being like the board members to manage the, the vault, uh, just to create the, the connection between blockchain and real world. So there's, if there's anything that needs to happen, it can happen quickly. And, and then the tokens are the representations of those shares. So this is all on the blockchain. You can see that path and you can see the ownership path. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's how it's structured so that, you know, there's always a collateral that's actually backing this currency that we created. Who who pays for the security of the the vault and to keep to make sure the gems are there and audits that and and where does that money come from to to upkeep for all this? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the foundation, they're the ones doing a lot of the management. You know, they are the trustees that are coordinating with the bank with the vault. If there's anything that needs to happen between them. Uh, we are the beneficiaries. So the ones that hold the token are the beneficiaries. And then the grantors is us as well, essentially. Yeah, we're, we're also the grantors because we're, we're going to create a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization that is going to be the voting power. So anything that we want to do later, we're going to give that access to the ones that are holding the tokens. Oh, and then okay. you can vote in. Yeah, it's all on the blockchain. It's all, all digital, all, all open source. Um, so effectively, did I answer the, your question? Yeah. Uh, the, the, so yeah, I think so. So effectively, what you're saying is that the the owners of the tokens would be a part of like this this DAO, and they could vote upon, hey, we want to put some more guards at the door to the vault, so we're going to what print some more tokens for these for the to fund this, or how would oh, you? Oh no, so the, so the money, right? So we're, we have 21 million tokens that have been created, so they've been minted already on the Ethereum chain. Uh, we separated a million tokens for marketing, for maintenance, okay. for upkeep, like any any value that needs to be flowed into you know the maintenance and the continue continuity of the project. Uh, we're going to have a million a million separated. But the idea is that you know because of the uh, having multi signature wallets, where one of the side of the keys is owned by the owners of the tokens, um, we can't do anything until everyone votes. Mm -hmm. You know we're going to have. We're going to have a, a detailed layer of like what the thresholds are 
because um, it's really hard to get 100% voting, you know, of everyone that's holding the, the, the keys. So we'll have like a threshold probably of how many we need to be able to open uh, or unlock the wallet. But that's the idea is to is to give back that power. Uh, so anytime we need to use some of the funds from the million tokens, um, well, A, right now, there's already a protocol built in that is automatic which is an affiliate system. So if you come in, you buy the token, you can uh, generate an affiliate link for our protocol. And then the, uh, you get paid 5% from whatever anybody uses your link with, uh, whatever they buy with. And you get that from the marketing uh, the marketing uh, treasury. Allocation. So the million tokens there. Yeah. yeah, you automatically get paid there. But then any costs above that, uh, to be able to open the wallet to get those funds, we have to go through the voting process. And then it, it's all open ledger, so you can see all that stuff moving around when it's happening. Okay. And then what after? What happens after the million tokens that's been set aside for these budgetary things and the upkeep? What happens when that's been used up? Then what? Yeah, the idea is that it won't because we'll be replenishing it. Um, so every time they use the tokens, uh, right now we have two separate ways. Well, there's there's d- different layers on how uh, they can benefit from the system, but there's two ways that is either going to burn the token to make it less, uh, uh, you know, have less in circulation, which should then drive the price up. Um, and then the other, th- so one of the ways is that you can use the tokens to go visit the gem mines. So we have, you know, the, the company that we're working with, they're like, no, we can do, we can offer up to the people that are token holders, VIP, and they can use their gems to come in and, and check out the mines. Um, so if we do that, we're going to take those gems that come in and deposit them back into the treasury into the marketing treasury. Uh, and then the other way is that you can exchange the gem tokens for real emeralds. So the mine company was like, Hey, let's make a metric so that or a variable that they can send us the gems and we'll give them the equivalent, the dollar equivalent in emeralds. And we'll like, we'll let them choose how they want it to be cut, the coloring, like how the quality of it, all that stuff. Um, and then that's that feature, yeah, that's really cool. So that feature uh, burns the token. So you, if, if you do that process, we'll burn it, which in turn should increase the valuation of the each individual token because there's less of them in circulation. Wow. Um, so there is, uh, and then the other two things, I'll say this, uh, the other two things is there is a 36-month th- refund buyback program that we built into it. So we launched it this past Thursday. It's starting on Thursday and it's going to go for 36 months. All unused gems, so right now you can buy it for a dollar on the platform, uh, but all unused gems, you can sell back to the mine at $4 in 36 months, guaranteed. How do you, how do you guarantee that? Well, there's, there's six, well, first of all, there's $644 million in assets in the vault. And we'll, we only have 20 million tokens that we're selling, so that's $20 million. Uh, 4X from that turns it to 80 million. So there's still $560 million in cushion or over collateralization, uh, which, which they can use to sell, to be able to gain money if they, if they need to, really worst case scenario. Um, but it's from the mine. The mine itself is using this as a way to like dip their toes into the space. Um, it's a multi-billion dollar company. They have 11 mines uh, worldwide. And so they're just committing to buying back the tokens um, you know, I, there's a side of speculation on their side that the value will go up because there's a, a 30x collateral collateralized vault. You know, there's 30x more of what the amount that they're getting for the stones. And and I'll, and I, and you might ask the questions like, why would they do that? Like, why yeah. would they just why wouldn't they just sell the stones? Yeah. Well, this is the solution that we're solving for the mine. Is when you are a mine owner. And you uh, find the, the the rock. Let's say you you found a six thousand dollar stone. By the time it goes through the refinery process, like when they have to like grind it down and 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 turn it into a, a specific size and shape, and maybe have a few of them, and then you go and you sell it to the jewelry stores, the people that are actually going to resell it, resell it, you're getting two hundred, three hundred dollars maybe. So you go from six thousand valuation to two hundred dollars, hmm. and they do that because that's how the the commodity industry works, you know, they, 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 and then they shoot, they, they create the jewelry and then they shoot up the price based on their brand. Um, so if we, uh, because we were able to solve the, uh, that whole middleman 
situation, that whole refinery process, the value that they're currently getting, just a 20 million for this lot that is worth 640 million, it's already probably triple the amount they would have gotten if they went through the refinery process and tried to sell it. So we're, they're willing to give that value back into itself to make sure that you know it's successful and, and there's a long... Because the, the idea is that we're going to either add more stones to the vault, um, we're going we're gonna to make um, different projects within you know, this, this marriage, this relationship with different assets. And the goal being to have a truly, you know, a true regenerative commodity backed system that there's true money. There's actually something tangible that you can touch. And it's not just based on negotiable instruments, you know, this debt, mm. debt monetary system we're all in. So uh, forgive me if, if I'm uh, mis misunderstanding this or not completely understanding this. So it's kind of like a futures contract with a uh, gem, like a, um, an emerald mine. In effect, you're kind of like, you're kind of purchasing your, you know, with the one to four, you know, four times your, your investment, you're kind of going, okay, I buy this gem token and I'm kind of like betting that this will go up and, and this company is guaranteeing it's going to go up uh, because they just, they see that value increasing in, in the future. Um, yeah, it, there, there's definitely a fine line because it's not about the speculative market. Like there's, de it's going to be live in probably two weeks. Uh, it's not necessarily about that. It's them saying, Hey, if in three years you, you don't like what you got, we'll buy it back. We'll, we'll do, we'll give you a refund at four X. So you have to, we have to call it a certain way so that it's not, uh, on the speculative, speculative side. Cause you can't, that's like insider, insider trading stuff. Like you can't say that, that, yeah, we promise you it will go up in value. It's like, no, it's about having a refund process, but can it go more than $4 in the 36 months? Absolutely. Especially, uh, you know, knowing the layers that we're going to be adding to this, you know, one thing that we just added back or we added into our marketing recently, which I was flabbergasted why we didn't do it initially in the, in the, in the, when we we're creating the rumors is that once a year, uh, so GIA is the Geological Institute of America. They are the global authority on uh, valuation of commodities. They, uh, you know, they're the ones that come in and look at the stone and look at the coloring and then give the value based on what's happening in the, in the world markets. Uh, we can pay them to come back in as many times as we want throughout the year for them to recertify the stones. And when they do that, they account for inflation. So actually it's already happened with this current stone. When we started this process, like all our marketing wasn't even updated until this last month because we thought it was the same value. But when we started this process, we started about a year and a half ago. Um, and he had already quickly immediately had stones in a vault in Brazil. And we went there, we did the valuation. The stones were worth around $250 million at the time. When we re, when we recertified it just this last month, it went up to six hundred and forty million dollars just through inflation. So, just through inflation, man, yeah. it blew my mind. And so I'm thinking, like, whoa, this is a big piece of information. Like, we need to add this to the marketing. That if we treat this like a, a savings account, where we're actually uh, with the long term perspective that this is going to store value or your purchasing power, just to adjust for inflation, mm -hmm. then who knows what the speculative market is going to do with that, you know. And then you, on top of that, you have that cushion too. So it's yeah, it's it's, it's so a big, so. Big. The, it, it's, but it's also dependent upon um, the valuation of these emeralds uh, maintaining in society. Like if society for some reason is like, oh, we don't, we don't, we don't really value emeralds anymore. Like who cares? Um, so so the valuation could p p potentially change. Potentially, obviously, it's unlikely, but, mm -hmm. um, similar with gold, people could just tomorrow go like, well, we don't value this anymore. Uh, hasn't happened in a long time, but you know, that that's could happen. So what happens if this, this, uh, you know, mine in, in 36 months, they, you, people say, oh, we want the, the four X return. Uh, and they, for some reason can't pay it. Then what happens? Or, or it's the, the, the emeralds aren't valued that much that they could pay it anymore. What happens then? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you're answering some. You're asking some tough questions there, bro. <laughs> this is my interview. What's going on here? <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. I'm curious. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm glad you're asking. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's definitely going to be on us to make sure that one thing that I teach in the in the academy is to really become aware of pyramid shape flow of energy, 
and, and really become aware of the traditional banking concepts so that it's not the value isn't flowing to the few and the value of some, or the price of the asset isn't manipulated by mainstream narratives. I think that's the biggest key is we have this tool that we can gamify, that we can really have fun with how we interact with it and how we create value in it. And the, the more that we can start to utilize and flow our own value into it based on the structure, based on what we're actually using it for, it won't matter what the world says. You know, that's, that's where you really start to separate from speculation and war-based games to utilization. And like, is this just a, are you, are we just staring at the price of something or mm. are we actually utilizing this and there's true value here? You know, you talked about gold, gold doesn't change its value. It's conductive, it's shiny, it's used, you know, for technology. It's, it's, a uh, you know, if you put it, you can like, you can eat it. There's it's health properties to it. The, the, the value doesn't change. It's intrinsic. What changes is the price. The price is what somebody's willing to buy or sell something for. That's war. You know, go play that game. It's great. Mm. So for us, um, yes, it's, you know, the, uh, the goal here is to create, I, I call it toroidalism, you know, so there's capitalism, which is there's a, a, a divisive form of capitalism now where it's more about somebody needs to lose for me to win and being very uh, looking uh, more like it's all about me mentality instead of like, no, there, there's a way that we can work together and it's enough, enough for everyone here. So this new form, I call it toroidalism, where the value is flowing back into itself. And so you, you essentially, with that flow, you are disconnecting from the mainstream narratives and it won't matter what happens in the mainstream. But um, I'll say this, one of the things that we're adding to the roadmap, where we've added to the roadmap is, again, he has 11 minds, 11 different minds. And so we're going to start to diversify. So we're going to start to have different types of assets built into there mm -hmm. so that you can kind of choose where you want to store the value based on what is happening in the narrative and what is happening around the world. Um, but yeah, it's all about utilization. It's all about shifting that relationship and shifting how we, uh, again, in the four years that I've been going down this road of, of recreating my identity with these systems and dependency, I've looked at, you know, where does the worth flow from? Well, it flows from us. We are the creditors. Mm -hmm. We, the physical body is what gives all of this meaning, <laughs> right? The consciousness inside this physical body is what gives it all meaning. So, um, you know, simply put, or what I said earlier, when you go to the bank and you ask the bank for a loan, your the signature, when you sign that application, they're using that as a, as a security. They take that, they go to their treasury direct bank account. So there's a bank, it's called the Treasury Direct Bank. Every bank banks at this bank because it's the one directly tied or connected to the Treasury Department and they can access the securities market. And so you can, they take that security, they go in there, they deposit it into their account and then they immediately get paid from the legacy account. Mm -hmm. I'll also say this, the average 35-year-old has over $100 million in that legacy account. The average 55-year-old has over $1.4 and, and the value inside that, you know, the asset side value of that legacy account is determined based on, you know, how, what your output is into reality. Like you, Graham, I'd say yours is a lot more than a billion, like, cause mm. you've, you've provided into society a lot of value from your body, right? I've you've put out a lot, a of, lot of energy. Yeah. You've signed a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. With big numbers on them. So that, you know, when, when they, when, when you sign those contracts, by the way, you know, this is for like uh, 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 people that play sports, actors, politicians, like anybody that is working in the public sector. When you sign that, that is the money. And then that whoever you sign that contract with, I wouldn't say this is true about signing with physical men and women. That's a different thing. It's when you sign contracts with organizations, with these non-living dead registered entities, most of them are flowing that security through a trust that is then t getting paid in the back end from your legacy account. And then they try to double dip on you. You know, the credit card that you signed for and applied for, they get paid immediately. And then they go to their bank system and then you just say, okay, here's $10,000. And then you have a card that represents the 10,000, but that's just fake currency BS, you know, that they just created out of thin air. And then they send you a statement, 
right? Which if you look at Black's Law Dictionary and the meaning of statement, it's an allegation. And they're just like, uh, yeah, you also own us, owe us this much with interest. And so they're trying to tr- double, triple, quadruple dip on you. So again, I say that because we are the creditors. We are the money. We are the thing that gives it value and meaning. And blockchain, if we do it right, and that's what I try to do with this with this system, with this project, if we, if we do it right, it won't matter what the what the narratives say because we are utilizing it, using it for a purpose. Hmm. And there's a lot to unpack there, dude. I'm I'm grateful you shared all this. And and sorry if I hijacked the interview. I just I was really like no, this I can't wait to talk to Otto and ask him all these questions. And as you bring up the stuff, I'm like, I could just wait till after we're done to ask him, but I hope this <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is still fun for you. I enjoyed myself quite a bit. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you asking. I've never had a chance to kind of go through that with someone. And like I said, I think that it's good to just be able to have these organic conversations and those listening kind of fly on the wall perspective and just like, you know, be able to experience two guys just catching up and, and uh, talking about life and talking about all the complexity of life. Amen, man. Um, I did have a serious, serious question though for you. Um, why is it, why do you call it disc golf? <laughs> <laughs> what do you call it? Frisbee golf? <laughs> Frisbee golf, man. I'm like, I was looking at your posts. I'm like, disc golf. What, what the heck is, this? is disc golf? <laughs> what is this guy talking about? <laughs> Uh, I don't know why we call it disc. We call it disky disc golf. Is that a Canadian thing? Maybe. Disc I, golf. I don't know. We call it, uh, I think Frisbee, I think we associate, fr- or at least we do, my friends and I, associate Frisbee with like when you're throwing, a. F- we still use the word Frisbee, but we only use it when we're like throwing a Frisbee to each other. If we're throwing uh, a Frisbee into a golf thing, chain thing, we call it a disc. Maybe that's just gotcha. me. Maybe everywhere else in Canada calls it Frisbee golf, but <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that was a joke question. That was a joke question, but but but, but serious at the same time. No, man. I, I again, I think it's all about having fun, right? Just having fun with words. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And understanding Using the what way they it's mean supposed too. to. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> yeah. maybe I don't know where disc come. I have to ask my buddies now why, why we call it disc golf. I just I've never questioned that. <laughs> in my mind, I, I'm thinking of like like a ceramic disc and you guys are you guys throwing ceramic discs at each other that's dangerous <laughs> no they're definitely those little plastic ones but yeah no we yeah we i love it man I, we play all the time it's it's so much do you play disc golf or frisbee golf i did in college yeah, yeah. i loved love doing that i like going to the beach too and just like spinning the the, the and i'm calling it a disc <laughs> <laughs> spinning, the, spinning the frisbee and like doing like trick trick things with this frisbee oh yeah 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 at the beach yeah. Uh, I grew up in Florida, so that's like one of the things that I used to do. And skinboarding, I love skinboarding. Nice. Um, you, you do any uh, like boarding or um, s- snowboarding or anything like that? Uh, not too much. I've done a little bit of snowboarding. Um, I tried the whole like being pulled behind a boat and like whatever they call that when you're on the board and you hold on. Oh, uh, wakeboarding. Wakeboarding. I tried that. Um, not so good at it. <laughs> I like bike ride. I like mountain bike. <laughs> mountain biking. I'm a big bike guy. So motorcycle riding, mountain biking, um, that kind of stuff I really enjoy. Um, but water sports, mm, I didn't grow up. Uh, my family, bless them, wonderful, loving family. We didn't have money for types of vacations or boats and things like that where we go out in the water. So as a kid, it was uh, that wasn't the type of fun we had. It was more like swim out to the log in the lake and try not to drown. <laughs> and that was what we did uh which i distinctly remember almost drowning and then having to float on my back all the way back to the shore because i was terrified i was going to die um oh, but no. uh, <laughs> but yeah no uh i'd say mostly my my sort of fun recreational time is is mountain bike type stuff uh motorcycle i'm gonna get i want to buy another motorcycle i swore mine years ago um but mm-hmm. i'm thinking about buying another one uh and then um just making fun little videos like my disc golf video or my, um, the other one where we're running the Hills Prince video, just having fun, making little yeah. fun joke videos, you know? <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that. So I've noticed that you started making some fun videos and that's, again, I think it stays into the theme of what we've been talking about. Having yeah. fun. It's like shifting relationship to, to everything. And just, I want to say like, you know, being able to make fun of things, but just being able to laugh. Yeah. And see the and see the the you know see the perspective of the situation that is going to bring this love based laughter and like <laughs> you know just love it I love life <laughs> so yeah dude and and that that hill sprints idea for the video I'll tell you a little backstory about it it was um, just a fun little video um, but I 
my buddies were like, let's go do some hill sprints for a workout. And I was like, oh, I really don't want to run hill sprints. <laughs> and I was like, how can I bring what, who and what I am and what I love to do into this idea of a hill sprints? And I was like, well, I love making movies. And I was like, you know what we could do is we could shoot a little video about us doing hill sprints. We'll, we'll figure out a story of some sort or some sort of idea. But when you're shooting a video, you have to all use all these angles. So we have to run full out. And for me, if it's like, you know, for a story, if we're doing it for a movie, oh man, yeah, I'll work out. I'll run as many hill sprints as I can because we're telling a story. If it's just me running hill sprints to get fit, I'm like, I can do it, but it's just, it's harder. So when I connected it to my joy and my love and my fun, uh, my fun aspect of life uh, and made a movie around it, it was like, okay, well, we got to run again because we got to get the drone shot now. And now we got to get this close. I was going to say, so if you have a bunch of uh, angles, <laughs> you got to, I mean, we know I've been in sets my, myself, yeah. so you, you, I'm sure you know for sure you have to do it four, five, six, seven times to get yep. the right shot in the right angles. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was the idea. I said, guys, uh, let's go do hill sprints. So I was like, can we, I want to shoot a video too. So you guys down with us? And they're like, yeah. And then my buddy Tyrone, he's like, I think he brought the battle mace and he's like, let's run with the battle mace. <laughs> I'm like, all right, sure. And then uh, my other friend, Sean was like, uh, let's toss it back and forth. So we're tossing the battle mace. And they're like, okay, well now what? Like, how do we end this? And then we called up another friend um, and he's, and we're like, we're going to have you stand and we're going to give you the mace and it's going to give you the power. And <laughs> I, I don't really understand what it was all about, but it was just fun. And I was, it was a way to work out and then infuse what I love to do into that and just have fun with it. And I think that's, um, to me, it's like, it's the more I can do that, the more I can sort of find ways to bring what I love and the magic of life into what my, some might call the mundane or working out or doing the dishes or whatever, find ways to kind of like be creative, find an inspiration in this moment, find a way to kind of like, how could I breathe more life into this, to more fun into this? Um, it's going to be different every time. And sometimes it's actually to be just present and to see what's actually there and stop trying to change it. It's just to be present with what it is. Um, and that's, that's, that's a valuable exercise as well. In the moment for the hill sprints thing, it felt like the right thing to do was to breathe some creative inspiration into that, make a video and it worked out. So <laughs> I love it. I, you know, and just to compound your thought there, it really is like, I, I've come to terms that God is in the, I don't know. It's in the relationships, right? So how do we relate to things, but how do we, how do we, how do we become aware of the things that we're not aware of? It's accepting the, I don't know. Like when you get to the, that point where you're mm -hmm. trying to make a choice on something and it's really like, you're kind of in the space of volatility. <sighs> you can breathe into that, I feel like that's when the cells open up and then the answers come and you kind of start to become aware of the solutions of where you're supposed to go. Bro, you're speaking uh, my language, man. This is, this is what I love to talk about is that space of the unknown because the mind mm -hmm. doesn't like it. The mind is like, well, yeah. I got to go 10 steps ahead. I got to know this. What about that? And it's like, it's in that surrender and that courage to take that step into that unknown. That I agree with you. That's the relationship to God. That is the most like the mwah, it is the most beautiful, sacred, uh, and challenging, but rewarding and fulfilling and nourishing place to be. Is am I okay in this unknown? Am I okay with not knowing? Am I okay just to be in this space? And and even when it's scary, like and you're like, I don't want to go to this path. I don't, I don't know what's down there. My mind's saying all these things. It's like. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's an, I mean, I can say it till I'm blue in the face, but I still have to practice it. I still have to go through my own personal mm. fears of it. I still, I'm still working on it. And, uh, just recently I had a, uh, my own sort of like, you know, um, I, I built an online network, um, time has come.com and we put it on mighty networks and, and, uh, had a community there and different, you know, activities and things that were going on there was fantastic. And I, I, I loved it in the community, people meeting with each other and creating new friends. And it was just fan awesome stuff. And I had this intuition, this sort of feeling coming over me that was like, you need to close it down. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> I don't like that. What do you mean to close it down? I need to know 10 steps ahead. Why would I close it down? I've built, I've spent so many years building this. Why would I close this down? And so I was like, kind of like, you know, uh, justify it to me, you know, this, this relationship to God, this relationship to the unknown of like, well, I, I can't have courage to step into the unknown and do this unless you tell me 10 steps down the road, what's going to happen. Like I, I can't do this. And, uh, 
that was, that worked for a little bit. And then it just, I have a, um, I have an agreement, uh, a relationship and a commitment to that still space inside of me that is whispering or nudging me and, and guiding me. I call it God, whatever people call it is, is, is fine with me. But, um, that to me is the first primary relationship of my life. And so when I get sort of nudges and, and insights and things that are guiding me, I, I, I promise myself to listen and my mind fights it, but I, I promise myself to listen. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And I'm like, man, I don't really want to do this at all, but I have to do it. And so it was only after I took that step that then I could start to see, oh, I see why I was guided to do this. I'm still going to do my podcast. I'm still going to have all these activities. I'm just going to move it to, to Substack, um, back to Substack where I had it before, but I needed to simplify and refine. And, um, mm-hmm. and this, I, I love, I'm a storyteller and I love telling stories. I love, um, I'm getting back into acting again and I need more, uh, to free up more of that energy and that time and that, those resources to do those things. And so this was a fantastic experiment and opportunity and, and creation and it lived its course and now it's time to move. And when I was in it, I was becoming identified with that mm. as being, this is what I'm doing. And yeah. so it was like, yeah. I need to, I'm being asked, I can feel it. I need to let this go, this identification with this and really surrender to what's emerging, what's coming up and how do I move into that and trust um, because I can't always see it with my logical mind, what the steps are and how this is going to play out. So I have to have faith and really surrender into this unknown. And that doesn't mean you just uh, avoid responsibility or if it gets tough, I run away. No, I, <laughs> I put a lot of work into it and I continue to put a lot of work into it. But that was the sort of um, the most recent sort of like, I have to trust. And now that I've trusted and I've made that decision and informed the members of my network um, that we're going to just, we're going to be transitioning and closing down the way it looks now. Um, I can now see, oh, that's why. I can see, oh, because I'm, you know, if I'm doing more acting and I get an audition or I get a, you know, something comes up, I don't have, I don't, this is not, and I don't want someone else to run it. I don't want it to be, um, you know, that far removed from me where it's like, you know, I'm mm. not even there anymore. It's just like this person pretending to be me or this person that is um, uh, just, you know, telling everyone what I said. I, if I'm going to be doing something, I want to be in relationship with it. I don't want it to be. Mm highly processed as best I can. Obviously there's going to be, you know, give and take there, but as best I can, I want it to be as authentic and real and, and, and genuine as I can. Anyways, that big rant to say, um, that's my own personal experience recently with this unknown space and this relationship to it. And yeah. it's always shifting and changing and, uh, and nobody, everybody experiences it and nobody can escape it. It's like, you, you all, everybody, if you try to escape it and you just lock everything down into what the mind can control and, you know, force its way through, it's like, yeah, you can do that. It's just very painful and it's diminishing returns, yeah. at least in my experience. Uh, so far better to have courage and faith and step out into the unknown and have exponential growth and abundance and blessings in your life. Just requires a bit more in the, in the immediate present and facing your fears and being honest with yourself. Oh, that was such a great, uh, share. Thank you for that. And I love that you touched on that with, with, um, I, how you, you started identifying right with the, the thing that the you role. were doing, yeah. the role, the role of being the project, that, yeah. that leader or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I teach my students is to become aware of dependency and, you know, we talk about the monetary system and like interacting with the systems in a dependency form where you start to rely on the system for your career, for money, for whatever. But I think in life in general, it's like when you start to become aware of the things that we're do- you're doing is how dependent are you on that thing uh, to the connection of your identity? You know, are you needing that thing? If you're need, if you're needing it to feel something, if you're needing it to feel successful, fulfilled, love, mm, I would I would argue that maybe that's an externalization of worth. You know, and you aren't identifying with the physical body and recognizing that you are giving it meaning. Mm. Yeah, bro. I love how I said that. <laughs> no, that, that was, this is good. This is good. Um, this is exactly what I think is important to become aware of in this reality now with everything happening. Uh, the more we can be, bring clarity 
to our relationships, to our identity, to how we are dependent on levels of the system, uh, we can start to recreate those relationships and yeah, take back control, take back control of the ship and be, you know, in, in control of our lives to the best that we can, you know, yeah. control what you can let go of the rest and, and live, love and laugh and just, you know, be in life. Oh, good stuff. Beautiful. Man, thank you so it. much. Thanks for having me. Thank man. you this so is, much. This is a fun conversation. And again, I apologize if I, <laughs> if I was taking over questions and such, but you, you have, you have a very interesting life, dude. And I, and I wanted to learn more. So thank you for sharing what you did as well. Ah, uh, I appreciate it. But ditto to you, man. You, I've always loved connecting with you and, and just catching up on everything. Uh, we always have amazing deep conversations. If you guys haven't watched our first interview, definitely take a look. I'll tag it here at the end of the, the, this uh, episode for those that are on YouTube. Um, but one last question, and then we can end it here. Uh, I always like to ask this question at the end. You're standing in front of millions of people. You have about 90 seconds to leave them with something, something that you want to make sure that they remember you by. What, what would you say? To remember me from like a message that I want to leave with them or something? Piece of, a piece of advice or something. You know, you, there's millions of people in front of you. 90 seconds. What do you say? Oh, geez. Um, uh, I, I would say it's one of my poems in, in my first book that I wrote. I, it's a, be honest with yourself and the rest is easy. All fears are spiritual revelations hidden behind your efforts to control your world. And I would share with them that, you know, this self-honesty and this presence with yourself, you can... You can get excited about uh, being saved by a political leader or some new technology or some big get rich quick scheme. But until you have the honesty and integrity with yourself, you're going to get roped into things over and over again, relationships, problems, challenges that will keep you spinning on your head. And so if you want to end that cycle, you got to be honest with yourself. And these fears that you have are actually beautiful blessings and spiritual revelations. And they're hidden behind your efforts to try and control the outside world so you don't have to feel afraid, so you don't have to be scared, so you don't have to feel insecure. And once you face those things through honesty with yourself and integrity, they crumble. And then you can rest into the glory and the magnificence of who you are and the sacredness of life. And then you see these um, beautiful blessings, these beautiful lessons, and these spiritual revelations uh, that were always there for you, hidden behind your efforts to control the world, your fears. Thank you, Graham. I got goosebumps listening to that. <laughs> I Thanks, love brother. it. It's all, but it's that frequency, man, that vibe. You, you are, you are really doing the work. I really appreciate you. I, I truly do. And keep doing what you're doing. Keep sharing what you're sharing. Uh, we need the waves. We need these waves in this reality. You know, the light, uh, light to beams you, really put out the love. Amen. Same to you, Thank man. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. If you guys want to connect with Graham, he is on Instagram. It is uh, Graham Wardle, G-R-A-H-A-M Wardle, A uh, W A R D L E, um, or your website, right? You have a uh, Graham Wardle dot io online. Graham Wardle online dot com. Yeah. Oh, Graham Wardle online dot com. Uh, connect with him, and uh, you know, go watch go watch the his series. It's good. I actually watched the first season all the way oh, through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. You look so young, man. Yeah, so I young. know. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Uh, well, I mean, away, 15 years ago, 16 oh, years ago. 17 or something like that now, I think. Yeah. Wow. 17, 18 years. Yeah. <laughs> love it. Love it. Thank you so much. Thank you all for watching. And last but not least, always remember gamify your abundance. I love you guys, and we'll see you next time.